Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELECT webinar on bid frame progress at the Library of Congress. I'm Erin Elsey, a member of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Judith Cannon, Jody Williamson, and Paul Frank. Judith Cannon is Chief of the Policy, Training, and Cooperative Programs Division at the Library of Congress. She also manages the program for cooperative cataloging and bid frame pilot training. She is responsible for making certain that the suggestions and experiences of those in the bid frame pilot entering the metadata reach the persons developing bid frame to assure its continuous development and refinement. Jody Williamson is a metadata analyst for the Network Development and Mark Standards Office at the Library of Congress. Before joining the library in 2017, she held a variety of positions at Innovative Interfaces in Emeryville, California, including Product Manager of the Sky River Bibliographic Utility. Jody has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Minnesota and an MLIS from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Paul Frank is a Policy, Training, and Cooperative Program Specialist in the Policy, Training, and Cooperative Programs Division at the Library of Congress. Paul has worked with the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, or the PCC, since 2004 and oversees the NACO and SACO programs. He also has been a bid frame trainer and training developer since the Library of Congress began the first bid frame pilot in 2015. Judith, Jody, and Paul bring much expertise to today's topic, and we're fortunate to have them with us. A few logistics for today's presentation. All of our attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation concludes. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation ends. And now we'll turn it over to Judith. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Good day, everyone. Uh, we're going to update you on where we are with this frame. There's a lot going on, and um, we're going to try and make this as informative as we can possibly make it. I want to assure you that if we don't get through all your questions today, we will be answering them after this program. So don't worry that your questions won't be answered. They will be. So I'm Judith Cannon, starting it out. I will be um, handing it over shortly to Paul Frank, and Paul will let you know um, that he's starting to speak, but you'll recognize that. And then it will be followed by Jody. Then we'll pass it back to Paul again. Um, then Jody and I might um, have some things to say at the end together, and um, I will do a few of the last slides. So it will be going back and forth, and you will be hearing different voices, but we will identify ourselves when we're taking over. So we're going to begin with talking about what we've accomplished in FY19. I'm not going to go into any detail right now, because I'm going to talk about each one of these topics in a minute. But these are the three major things that um, we're looking into right now. Now, in 2019, Beach Wiggins said that he wanted the bid frame pilot expanded. And we had to expand it to over 100 active participants because we had to know that it could handle a lot more people. Um, we began the expansion, uh, the first expansion, up to 50 catalogers in June 2017, but we expanded it further last year to 50 more. And this was a huge undertaking. Uh, 
particularly as we brought in staff members in Cairo, Nairobi, Nairobi Islamabad and Jakarta offices. And uh, that was very exciting for us. They were terribly enthusiastic and um, they've been helping us enormously, particularly in the area of um, non-Latin script. So uh, we also set up a confluent site to use for communication um, and to also use for answering questions because we now um, have 100 people from different parts of the world wanting us to answer their questions. We also started something else. So critically important as we go forward in this is getting input from the catalogers, the people that are actually participating in the pilot. And um, we have now on the books monthly all participants meetings. So far we've only had to cancel one of those meetings because we didn't have enough to discuss with them. And I think you can imagine that was um, in January 2020 because we had all been having too much of a good time on holiday and we haven't made the kind of progress that we had anticipated with all the holidays that we might make. So um, we also have to have these um, webinar sessions with the overseas officers that are going very well and their contributions have been absolutely fantastic. I want you to know also that everything that we're creating in the way of training materials is accessible to you on the Catalog of Learning Workshop page. Paul is now going to talk to you. Hi everyone, this is Paul Frank. I, I want to tell you about the BibFrame training manual that we created during fiscal year 19. I'm particularly proud of this achievement. Um, I want you to imagine what the scenario was like here when we first started experimentation with BibFrame in 2015. The frame was being developed. We had the a prototype for a pilot. We had participants in mind to be trained in, in BibFrame. But because BibFrame was changing day to day, we had to ask the Network Development Office to cease development for a window so that we could develop training materials. NetDev Network Development um, Office um, was very gracious, accommodated our request so that we could get all of the pilot participants in phase one through the training. But the minute the training was over, development went back into BibFrame and continued in an ongoing fashion even to today. And as you know, it's, it's still being developed and, and changed. And all of the tools that we use in BibFrame are constantly being changed. So because of this, we would have periodic meetings with the pilot participants throughout the, the run of the pilot from 2015 on. And at each meeting, we talked about the incremental changes that were being made in the BibFrame editor or in the BibFrame database or, or in other tools that were used in BibFrame. But we really did not have a way to document these changes in a um, lasting way. So one of our major goals in fiscal year 19, which we achieved, was the creation of this, this training manual. And um, if you, the slide has a link to, to the manual, I'm not gonna go to it right now, but you can see on the slide here some of the, uh, the chapters in the manual. This is a totally online manual. It's on the Catalogers Learning Workshop page that Judith mentioned um, in the previous slide. And we are updating this manual constantly to reflect the latest changes that we are experiencing with BibFrame in the editor and in the BibFrame database and just with the general workflows that we, that we use in our BibFrame pilot. In fact, that last bullet on workflows is um, one of the most um, I, I get, in a way, you could call it a local chapter for LC BibFrame, but it's a very illuminating chapter that shows how the workflows for resources being described in BibFrame have been developed for, for pilot members, pilot participants. Remember, at this point, we still 
are not considering uh, the BigFrame database our database of records. So all of the work that participants do in the BigFrame uh, editor and BigFrame database needs to be replicated and marked in our um, ILS system. So, th so there's double work involved and these workflows that are in the last chapter of the training manual outline those rather complex workflows and, and have documented them. So I'm, I'm, I, I can't let this slide end without thanking two colleagues who joined the um, Policy Training and Cooperative Programs Division last year. They are trainers by profession. They're not necessarily catalogers, but they were able to take an in-depth look at all of the documentation that we had that was scattered all over the place pull it together and create the core of this big frame training manual, which is relevant to anyone interested in linked data. It's not specifically a big frame training manual for big frame only. I think that the, um, the information in this training manual is relevant beyond big frame. So I invite you to take a look and, uh, and see what we've been doing here in, in our training development for um, our pilots. The uh, another accomplishment in fiscal year 19 is an exploration of non-Latin script descriptions in BibFrame. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the discussion in the community. There was a very lively set of meetings at the recent ALA midwinter meeting in Philadelphia about this. Um, we're looking at practices that are not as old as some of you think. The, the, the technique of providing romanized data along with native script data in a marked bibliographic description is relatively new. It hasn't been around for a long time, maybe since the mid 80s when the capability to input um, scripts online came into place. So um, we're now looking at the, the value of doing that, we are certainly listening to our pilot participants who work with non-Latin scripts and find that the need to romanize actually uh, increases their workload considerably. And we're looking at areas where we can, can do well, if not better, without romanization and, and looking at areas where we still need to rely on romanization. One of our big uh, takeaways from the discussion so far is that it's, an, it's not a one-size-fits-all for romanization. Some scripts may need more romanization than other scripts, and we've also learned that there are many automated tools. They might not work perfectly, but they certainly are um, able to be used and refined, and we look forward to experimenting a lot more with those in the future. Um, I'm going to pass the, the, um, the speaker over now to my colleague Jody, who will talk about some BitFrame editor developments, database changes, and technological achievements. Thank you, Paul. Hi, this is Jody Williamson. I'm in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office at the library, and this is just a brief summary of what we're going to be covering with the BibFrame editor enhancements and new features, some database enhancements and new features, um, a little bit of an update on BibFrame to Mark, and then we're going to finish up with the BibFrame description in uh, id.loc.gov. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties all of a sudden here with the slides not wanting to advance. There we go. Thanks. So in the last fiscal years, we worked on the BibFrame editor. Uh, the experiences that our uh, catalogers were bringing to us were very much guided our development because there were some things that were becoming challenging for them and they made it known to us and we worked very hard to improve them. And we also, we were really trying to focus on their experience using the editor. 
Another thing that came out from working on the bid frame editor and looking at the data as it was created within the editor and then we compared it to the data that was being generated from our mark to bid frame conversion program and then as we started testing the bid frame to mark conversion program, uh, there was some differences in how the data was being created and generated and so we had to work to sort of smooth out those differences to pre prevent, present, sorry, in a standardized data structure, no matter where the data originated, be it in MARC or uh, regenerated MARC or native in the big frame editor. Some of the visual things that we changed in the editor were reducing the amount of white space that was on the screen, the browse display that the catalogers saw of all of their descriptions was modified slightly to provide additional information, we shortened some field labels within the editor profiles, which helped free up more room for other information. Um, all of the mo little individual modal windows had save buttons at the bottom, and we put the save button also at the top. On a small window, it looks kind of ridiculous, but on a large window, it's really valuable because the cataloger does not have to scroll down the screen just to save their work. Um, activity buttons, which are posting your description to our database, saving the description to the local editor database, or canceling the work that you've done, were moved to the top of the screen to also prevent the cataloger having to scroll all the way down. And we added in some visual cues by the use of border colors for the work instance and item to help provide a guide to everybody about what they were actually looking at. So some of these are easier to illustrate on a screen than others. So this is a, my favorite example of how the field labels were shortened. At the bottom there, where it says statements of responsibility relating to title proper, RDA 2.4.2, .2 was the original label that appeared in the instance description for the statement of responsibility. The original plan when the editor was set up was to very much mimic the RDA terminology. And two years into the pilot, we decided to be a bit more concise and just a statement of responsibility. Um, at the bottom of this screen, we have an example of the save being at the top and the bottom of the window. So here is an example where it seems borderline silly to have two save buttons within two inches of each other, but you have to imagine how it would look on a work menu that you have to scroll down. Here's an example of our border colors. So green is the color that is used to illustrate a work, and the blue is for the instance and the gold for the item. These are consistent across all of our profiles in the editor, so regardless of if it's a monograph work or a sound recording work, the work is always in green. Some of the other functionalities that we added in was a way to auto-save a, a description as it's being cataloged to prevent data loss. So there are, as the cataloger is editing different templates or menus within the description, as the individual menu is saved, the entire description is saved at the same time. We added contextual information displays during lookups for authorized headings and work, which is a way of providing a bit more information so that the cataloger is sure that he or she is picking the exact heading or work that is needed. And we have, um, it's a hover functionality, so um, you can see it in action. Uh, text input areas can be resized, which is very helpful when you're editing a very long description or a very long content notes field, that you can actually see all of the text and not just have to scroll through the tiny little bar, uh, menu bar. Uh, we have options for inputting a text string or a controlled vocabulary term in the cases where the controlled vocabulary term is not what the catalog wishes to include, they can just input the uh, text string that they wish to list. And we have an option for searching some of these terms by code or name. So we call the contextual display lookup a mouse over, where you type in, in this case, your subject cataloging, and when you go down and highlight the first term off to the left, the menu bar pop, or the menu box pops up, where you can see the various spelling for cataloging and the broader terms associated with cataloging. And if you're still not sure if this is the heading that you need, 
you can then click on the view at on id.loc.gov and see the full um, authority record in ID. For uh, personal name lookups, we also usually see the source information that originally appears in MarkTag 670. And in the works, you will also see um, variants and I'm trying to remember what else. Usually an option to go view and evaluate. Relationships. And relationships, yes, they call. Here's an example of how the text input box can be resized. So in the top box is sort of the brief display that um, appears in the editor. And then if you click on the little pencil to edit it, you can then go in and see the full summary note. And I've circled the little expander bar so you can drag that down and then see the entire summary note and potentially realize that the, a word in the tenth line is misspelled and you can go down and see it. Originally, what the cataloger would see when they were editing the summary would pretty much be what displays in that top box and they would have to put their cursor in the box and and arrow to the right to see the entire string and it was really easy to lose your place. Here's an example of the code lookup versus the label lookup. It's especially appropriate for the country codes because you always think of those in terms of the codes and not in terms of the label. And so a cataloger could type in CAU and get the California, or they could type in California. At this time, the display of each of these is slightly different. If you search by CAU, that's what you're going to see in the editor. And if you search by California, that's the label you're going to see. But the important thing is that no matter which search option you use, the underlying URI is the same in both cases, and that's what's important in the linked data environment. We've also been working on converting good frame data into MARC. Paul mentioned earlier that our catalogers right now are doing double work. They do their cataloging in BibFrame, and then they turn around and do it in MARC because our MARC database is still our database of records. We would like to reduce the amount of duplicate work that our catalogers are doing and having a programmatic way to convert bid frame data into MARC data is the way to make that happen. We are currently testing our conversion programs and processes and they should be publicly available soon. When they are made publicly available, I'm sure the announcement will go out to at the bare minimum the bid frame listserv and probably more, so keep an eye on that. And I just want to outline a few of the changes that you will see in these converted MARC records in their current iterations. You will definitely see more URIs except field zero. We are not creating 007 fields at this time. The data that is stored in an 007 field is getting moved to a different places in the 3XX MARC tag block. So you will see more of those in the MARC records. The 008 field is much more generalized because the format specific bytes from the 008 are being stored in other parts of the MARC record. A big one for that is that all genre form terms are now in field 655 only. And there's also some data cleanup which leads to more data consistency. And now we'll look at a few examples of this. So for the no 007 field, but more 3XX Field. The first 338 tag that you see there that says microfiche and then the URI for the carrier actually came from an 007 byte. And during the mark to bib frame conversion, those, those specific bytes from the 007 were placed in the bib frame carrier uh, property and class with the URI because we want to preserve the URIs as much as possible. When we go from different to ARC, we're putting them into MARC tags that will store a URI. Coded information in the 007 and 8 cannot, you can't have a URI because they're byte dependent fields. The 340 field for your base material of plastic is also, it also originated from a byte in MARC tag 007. And the URI was generated during the MARC to bib frame conversion and to ensure that it is retained in the bid frame to mark conversion if the data is placed in mark tag 340 subfield A. The 
three 344 tags also all came from bytes in the 07. Because each of these terms is associated with a different vocabulary, there are multiple occurrences of MARC tag 344 in these output MARC records. This is a practice that's out there in the world. I think it will become more common as we are storing more of these URIs because you it's not good to chain multiple terms and multiple URIs all within a single mark tag because it's very, very difficult to pair them together correctly. The um, bytes that are populated in our general OOA field are the bytes 00 to 05 for the date that it was entered into the database, the date type field if it's single or multiple, uh, date one, date two, the place of publication, and the language code. All of the other bytes in the field at this time are filled with either blank spaces or uh, vertical bar characters for uh, fill. And here are some examples of genre form terms that began their life in, I believe all of these came from different parts of the 008 tag. And they're now in MARC tag 655 in the bib frame to MARC record. So encyclopedias came from the nature of content spikes in 008, uh, by 24 to 27 for monographs. Conference papers and proceedings is a single byte, I believe 29, but I'm not positive. Poetry is coming from the literary form byte. And finally, the popular music is uh, by 18 and 19 in the music format 008 tag. It's uh, PP and it's translated to Bajan Return Popular Music. And here's two examples of more data consistency that I've found so far. In the first example for qualifiers, subfield Q was added to a lot of the identifier marks fields several years ago, but of course data cleanup is time consuming and not always done. So when the data is converted from mark to bib frame, the conversion program looks for these uh, qualifier fields that are usually in parentheses and it places them into the bib frame qualifier property. Since they were separated for the mark to bib frame conversion, we keep them separate when the data comes from bib frame to mark. So the data then becomes just the ISBN is in mark tag 020 and the qualifier is moved to subfield Q. Similarly, publication and distribution manufacturer data from MARC tag 260 is converted into the bib frame properties and classes related to provision activity. And when it goes from bib frame into MARC, it be, is placed in MARC tag 264. If we have the specific public, publisher distribution manufacturer data, the appropriate second indicator is assigned. The default is the second indicator of one for publication. And now Paul is going to talk about what we've done in ID. I think one of the uh, most underdeveloped areas of big frame exploration or even linked data exploration is a discovery layer. And we have a linked data service at the Library of Congress, id.loc.gov, that many of you know, and I'm sure you've used it for um, some of the controlled vocabularies that are there. But the, the bid frame pilot participants who are describing resources in bid frame uh, described those resources into a bid frame database that was uh, that's internal to Library of Congress, so it, it could not be shared outside of the library. So in order to to make all of the data that we're creating available to the world, we've posted our bid frame works and bid frame instances on id.loc.gov. Now, I'm not saying that this is a discovery layer, but it certainly is a prototype for a future discovery layer. This, by the way, is the entire LC database of bibliographic descriptions because we have converted the entire database 
to bid frame. Our bid frame pilot participants are, are adding new descriptions and editing existing ones, but, but this is the uh, complete LC database in link data format on id.lock.gov. Um, on this slide, you see uh, uh, digging down a bit into the, the bid frame works area, a listing of the works and some faceting that's been developed on the left-hand side that can be um, used to, to narrow the search to come up with um, um, more detailed information or more refined information based on the needs of the searcher. Um, we'll continue to uh, post our bib frame descriptions, works instances to id.lock.gov and we are also experimenting and continuing to uh, develop id.lock.gov to become a potential prototype discovery layer for uh, resources at the Library of Congress. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Judith to talk about future goals for uh, fiscal year 20. Um, every year we try to put together um, goals for the next fiscal year. We're not always successful about having them ready when the fiscal year starts because our fiscal year starts in October. But generally, we have them done um, by the end of the calendar year and have them approved because we certainly wish to be able to address them in the new year with everyone. So this year, we did something slightly different. Normally, we have just... Um, gone ahead with goals, the director's goals, NDMSO with goals, and um, PTCP's goals, formerly COIN and PSD, now combined. And this year we did something different. We, we put together some strategic goals, things that we feel we definitely have to um, accomplish because without them, uh, we can't really move forward. And one of the most critical ones is to pro programmatically be able to convert metadata from bid frame to mark. Now we can now convert from mark to bid frame and we've talked about that as we've gone through. But the big emphasis now is on bid frame to mark. We want to be able to continue to add bid frame descriptions to ID lock.gov because as, as Paul said, um, this is a very important way for us to learn more about discovery, etc. Uh, we need to have this ability to um, create name authority descriptions in bid frame because the catalogers want to be able to do their work in bid frame. They don't want to um, have to leave bid frame and go and do some of their work in mark and they don't want to have to repeat their work in our Voyager database. They really just want to be able to focus on bid frame. Um, and because they want to do this, we've got to um, improve the searching cap capabilities in idlock.gov. So those all relate to um, us advancing it. But meanwhile, at the same time, we've got to be able to import um, external descriptions into the bid frame editor and database. And um, that is, these are major strategic goals. Um, and you may have heard that we are going to be acquiring a new ILS. It's down the road somewhere yet, but um, we have to make sure that whatever we acquire, that it, bid frame, it will accommodate bid frame. So that's another um, important strategic goal. Now then our director, Beecher Wiggins, um, put together some, his, some of his goals for the coming year. Um, one of them is continue to expand the bid frame 2.0 pilot. Now right now, we don't have any dates for this or any numbers, and I'm not pursuing it um, right now because PTCP is an overload because we're also the division not only helping to expand the use of this frame within um, LC, but also we're responsible for putting the policy statements into the beta RDA toolkit. 
So I haven't, I can't tell you honestly what the expansion of the bid frame 20 pilot at this point means, whether it means it's going up to 150, 200, whatever. We need to um, do a lot more work in evaluating discovery as it relates to bid frame. We haven't really um, paid sufficient attention to this. I mean, we, we've attended discovery from the point of view of the cataloger, but we need to also think about the external audience. And um, so that, that is one of our goals for this, this year. We also want to make the bid frame database available for public consumption. We know that people outside are desperately eager to um, be able to really explore our bid frame database. And Jody mentioned this, uh, and this is a biggie. Those in the pilot participant are very, very eager to be able to work in the bid frame editor only. And um, some of these brave souls uh, have been work creating records in the bid frame editor as well as in March since 2015. That's, they've been doing this for four years. They are more than ready to kiss that exercise goodbye. So let's take a look at um, MD MSO goals. Because of where we're situated and because of who um, we work with, security is a high priority at the Library of Congress. And every time we think we've reached maximum security, we find security can go a little bit further. And so we can never be complacent about security. Anyway, NDMSO was faced with a tough decision. Um, you, everyone had to make a choice what was going to happen to their system. Was it going to the cloud or was it going to be moved to some secret location? And don't ask me the location because I don't know the location. Um, and I think that MDMSO made a very wise choice. Sally chose the cloud. So this has turned out to be quite a bit of work. And um, they've got to um, work on stabilizing this application in the cloud. And um, I don't think anyone anticipated exactly what it was going to involve at the time the decision was made, but I know it was the right decision regardless. They're going to reconvert the entire MARC database, which is millions of records. Um, again, we've done it once already. We know we can convert it from MARC to BizFrame, but they're going to do it again. And in doing this, they're hoping to improve the specification. And at the same time, um, stabilize um, some of the issues that have been involved with um, making this conversion and uh, title authorities, non lantern scripts, and relationships to Mark. But these are big issues that they're having to tackle, and I think that when people are looking from the outside in and saying, hey, wait a minute, why does the bid frame to Mark conversion take so long? I think that some of these things point out it, it's not a simple undertaking. It's a very, very complex undertaking. So, um, with the library has stabilized the mark to bid frame conversion. That is very good. But the trouble is, you convert a mark record to bid frame, but then when you go to convert that bid frame record that was converted from the mark record back to um, a mark record again, it doesn't convert back to the mark record that you started with. And so what the Library of Congress needs to understand right now, and when I say the Library of Congress, I'm really talking about the staff in, in DMSO who are working so hard on this. They need to understand what is going on, what is happening. We understand what's happening when we convert a MARC record to bid frame, but why, when we're converting that bid frame record back to MARC, do different things happen? And when they understand all of that, their conversions will go much more smoothly. So the other thing that they're looking at is um, 
possible redesign of the editor and they have a contractor working on that and when they've had time to analyze um, the information um, supplied to them, then they can begin working on the redevelopment of the editor. Uh, we want to get all the LC classification schedules um, added to id.loss.gov because um, then we can use um, linked data strategies in classification, which we don't have open to us right now. And then as far as refining the name authority module, we need to um, clarify what we're doing in there so that um, we can increase the authority work done in the editor, uh, in the BizFrame editor, because this will facilitate um, transferring the data. And um, right now we, we have quite a bit of work to do in this area, but I feel very confident we will achieve this in this fiscal year. And of course, as NDMSO makes any progress, they have to continually work on reviewing and improving their technical documentation that they share with you. Um, Paul and Jody, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I guess the other uh, goal for us in the network development and Mark Sanders' office would be to increase the collaboration with the current uh, partners who are using linked data, mainly the Castellini Libri and their Share VDE project, the TCC cohorts, which are part of the linked data for production grant that Stanford is coordinating. Uh, Libris is the Swedish system that the Royal Swedish Library has set up. Um, all of the catalog people cataloging in Sweden are actually cataloging in BibFrame through a, a catalog and editor interface, and also OCLC with their new Mellon grant. Um, on the other goal from the previous slide, I think that covered everything. The we are currently working right now on the system migration up to the cloud. And I think the target is for it to be finished by, by mid-year, if not earlier. And the stabilizing the mark to bib frame and bib frame to mark conversions, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of that has come out with our work with bib frame to mark that it has led to changes needing to be made in the mark to bib frame side. And we're working on a new version of the mark to bib frame conversion scripts and specifications as well. Okay. Now I'm now going to this is Judith. This is Judith back again. I'm now just going to talk about the PTC P goals. Basically our goals are a continuation of what we had in FY19. We need to get the bib frame manual into an HTML format, but we need to completely review and improve it so that anything that comes out of these monthly meetings with the participants that's going to result in a major change, we have to take, make note of that and incorporate it into the manual. So you do want to watch the manual if, if you're following along and you're going um, to the catalogers workshop page and opening it up, there may be newer versions down the road. But we want to also be able, um, we're planning to identify a page that's been updated. So you will be able to see that. Um, we're con constantly developing new training materials. We don't normally make each one of these little documents available, but these documents are going to be incorporated now in the BIM3 manual as we go along. Uh, we know we have to expand the participants pool, but I've already told you I've not explored exactly what that means or when the timeline is for that. And we do meet regularly with the participants. Uh, basically, this last slide is a summary of what we've got to accomplish. And I'm not going to go um, over it in any detail, but I am going to say something to you that I heard yesterday when we had a participants meeting. One of the um, BizFrame catalogers at the meeting asked 
what are you really sort of expecting from us? Uh, are we supposed to be thinking about Mark as we do bid frame? And I responded, no, that I didn't think that you were supposed to be doing that. We're moving into a different era. And bid frame and Mark are very different. And they don't um, completely relate to each other. And then afterwards, the cataloger was talking to me and saying that it's so hard not to think about Mark. She said, I go to create my bib frame record in the bib frame editor, and I'm thinking bib frame, bib frame, bib frame, link data. And then she said, I have to turn around and put it into the ILS Borgia as a Mark record. And so she said, even though I'm doing it in the bid frame record, in my subconscious mind, I know I'm going to be converting it and putting it into a mark record. And we have been saying all along that it was very unwise, um, or it was, I shouldn't say unwise, it was not desirable to have um, double cataloging, creating a record in bid frame as well as mark. But I now realize um, this conversion from bid frame to mark is even more imperative so that people um, can work in bid frame and free their minds from the mark mindset. And I don't think I had ever appreciated, yes, or yes until yesterday, the difficulty that was facing them. Um, Paul and Jody, do you want to add anything in that summary? I think they don't. That was a great Okay, they, they, they're happy with the ending. So um, I guess we can throw it open to questions now. All right, great. Thank you, Judith. Um, so as Judith said, we're moving into the question portion now. If you have not yet done so, please type your question into the question box in your GoTo panel there. Um, we have already had some come in, so we'll go ahead and get started. And the first is that we have someone who's really new to both cataloging and bib frame. So can you just tell them where they would access the catalogers learning workshop? Uh oh, so, um, well, there, there's a URL for it. And certainly could just in a Google search, catalogers learning workshop, it should come up. But I'm happy to send it as a uh, as a link to everyone after the webinar. If I or I could send it in the chat right now. Um, it's just a direct link to all freely available cataloging materials that, that we post. And not only the Library of Congress posts there, but PCC, Program for Cooperative Cataloging Training Materials, are there as well. Um, this is Judith. Um, we really would love ev everybody to go there and advertise it. Um, I've done my very best to advertise it to the overseas offices and to try and get them to tell people, um, because although we have um, six overseas offices, there are a lot of satellite offices, like for instance, the Jakarta office has a satellite office in, in um, Vietnam, uh, in Thailand, in the Philippines. And I really want people using this because you can go there and you can change the material, you can translate it into your language. You can do anything you like with that material and use it for teaching, and it's all freely available. And this is Jody. I just want to add another URL. All things bib frame can be found at loc.gov slash bib frame. The ontology is there. Our data specifications are there. The, the conversion viewer is there. You can put in an LCCN is your favorite mark record and then see how it renders out in BibFrame. And there's also links to the presentations that we have done at ALA about BibFrame. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you all. Yeah, I think, Paul, if we can send that out, if you send that direct link to me, we'll send it out in the follow-up email that we send to attendees. Okay, that sounds good. I'll do that. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is, uh, are you all able to tell us a little bit more about which the integ I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. <laughs> are you all able to tell us a little bit more about the integration of BibFrame and the next-gen ILS that you're looking at? Um, are there any particular ILS systems that you're currently experimenting with? Uh, no, and um, there is very little that I can tell you at the moment. 
Um, I do know that a request for information has gone out, that is all. Uh, none of the rest of us know very much else about it, um, but I can say that on December, uh, on March the 12th, we will be a bit better informed because we're going to have um, a presentation on this at, at the um, library. Uh, I don't think it, it will not be available for um, public consumption. It is for the staff here, and it's very much an internal thing just to keep staff here informed. But um, we are funded, funded by the federal government. Uh, you, you can't completely predict anything. And um, certainly, I think that us moving to a next-gen ILS is several years away. And um, because once you, you get the funding, then there's another process. But first of all, you, you've got to get the funding approved. So but we're exploring, we're looking at what's out there. We know we have to do this, but um, don't hold your breath. It's not happening this year, and I would definitely say it's not happening next year. All right, thank you. And the next question is on some of the kind of phasing out of Mark and moving into Big Frame is that does Library of Congress have any plan to terminate the use of the 007 field and limited use of the 008 field in the near future? Um, terminate the use meaning that we would not, we would like deauthorize it from the Mark format. I doubt it. Yeah, that's what I think it means. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, there are no plans like that. Right now, this is just, our, our goal at the moment is how many URIs can we preserve? And we're exploring ways to make that happen. We will probably get a lot more feedback as the programs are out in the public more, and that will modify potentially what's happening. It's very early days yet to, to really speculate on what these final mark records are going to look like. As far as Mark goes, I don't want anyone out there panicking. Mark is going to be around for a long time, and we all know that. So that um, we're going to be living in a dual environment, and there's no way out of that. So I, I hope that anyone that's listening isn't sitting there panicking and thinking that in two years, they'll be expected to be in a linked data environment. It, it's not going to work like that. And that's why um, the Library of Congress has to make sure that it can, can continue to distribute MARC records. And I just want to add on to that. One thing that I ask everyone who is familiar with MARC to think about is how much information is intentionally duplicated in a mark description. So we have this flat mark description that if you blow it up into big frame, you're going to pull out work data, you're going to pull out instance data, you're going to pull out item data all from this flat mark record. There's a lot of duplication there. So I'm not saying that a lot of it can go, but certainly some of that duplication could be eliminated and big frame is very clean in that sense in avoiding duplication. All right, thank you for that explanation. Um, next question is, has anyone working on the BibFrame Authority Editor been talking about giving that code to the Synopia developers? Hmm. I'm trying to think. Synopia has access to all of our code right now, and then they used it and as a base and then went off and developed their own editor. We haven't really pursued how we would change it. Right now in the editor, if you are creating, a, say, a description of a monograph and a, the, the creator is somebody who doesn't have an authority record, you can conceivably put in all of the elements that would make up a mark authority record. But when they're saved, they sort of stay within this big frame bibliographic description. And that's really not desirable. So what we have to do is figure out a way to separate these components more so that 
all of the work that the cataloger can do in BidFrame to establish this name heading can get saved off separately from this bibliographic description that's being created. And I was just in a meeting this morning where we were talking about this, but we don't have any solutions yet. And once we add it to our editor software, it would be made publicly available on GitHub for everyone. And there's a big legacy of Mark tied with name authority distribution. So this is not a very easy step. And in fact, this is why I think it's taken us quite a while to explore it in greater detail. We have to consider record distribution internationally when we're dealing with name authority records. And that's heavily tied to Mark at this point. So there, there may be other ways to get that our RDF um, mods, mads data from bid frame for authorities into Mark, but but that still needs some exploration. Very much. All right, and then we do have time for just one more question. Um, in some ways, it build on what Paul just said, and that has anyone been looking into the possibility of storing some of the metadata that will allow for Mark records that have been converted to bid frame to eventually be converted back to the more granularly, granular mark format if needed. Um, that's a good question. And I think a lot of that might be possible just in terms of how the um, XSLT style sheets are constructed for the bid frame to mark process that there'd probably be ways that an individual institution could go in and modify those to meet their particular needs. One of the things that we, I think, are either blessed or burdened by, depending on your point of view, is that our database is very large. And so a lot of the programs that we create have to be workable in a volume operation. And in a smaller database, you probably could tweak a conversion of a, a very general conversion program to be very specific to your individual. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, that is going to wrap up all the time that we have today. So thank you to both our presenters and thank you to all of our attendees who have been with us. Um, our attendees, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. If you could please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and do help our continuing education committee plan future events. And this email will also include links to today's slides and recording. You also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance and that information you can also find in the email. Thanks once again to our ju presenters, Judith Cannon, Jody Williamson, and Paul Frank. And thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Eva Sorrell and Tiffany Henry, and to Alana Warren from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. Alex does have other continuing education events coming up. We still have a full spring webinar season ahead of us. The next webinar will be on Wednesday, February 19th, covering metadata enriching and discovery. Please see the ELECT website to register for these or find more information on this and other upcoming webinars. And finally, ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be on February 25th, discussing making the case internal and upward marketing for technical services. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Once again, thank you all for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.